You are listening to WMPG 90.9 Gorham Portland, Southern Maine Community Radio from USM. Live from the Orion Cygnus arm of the Milky Way galaxy, this is Scientifically Speaking, a weekly half-hour program devoted to elegant curiosities, and I am one of your hosts, Sarah Chang, and joining me as always is Bernie Rhyme, DJ Starwatcher. How are you, Bernie? Yes, I say I'm very good, thank you. Bernie is a professor of the Astronomy Lab here at USM and our local protector of the night sky. Reach out to us at WMPG Scientifically Speaking at gmail.com or on Twitter at WMPG Speak. And you can head over to WMPG.org to find the last five weeks of archives of all of your favorite shows, including this one. Bernie, could you let our listeners know what is up in the night sky for this coming week? Okay, certainly. So this will be the last day of the year, 1231, Friday. Uh, so we're going to have a rainy crescent moon. <laughs> it's going to be just um, a few days before the new moon. Uh, the last quarter was back on the 26th. So basically, it's going to rise at 5 in the morning and set at 2 p.m. Uh, the days are starting to get a little bit longer, but they're still very short. It's like the latest sunrise, not till 7.14 in the morning. And the sun will set at 4.13, so it's setting a couple minutes later, but you probably won't really notice the days getting longer for a few more weeks. Uh, but the neat part is we're actually going to have four planets now in the evening sky just for a few more days. Pretty much the whole last uh, season we had three planets. Venus was catching up with Saturn and Jupiter. So those three are still there. Um, but Mercury is going to join them now. So Mercury is going to get fairly close to Saturn. It'll actually be higher than Venus because we're going to lose Venus just a few days into the next year. So we'll see four planets in the evening sky for about an hour after sunset. And then, uh, so actually the only planet that won't be up will be Mars, and you can see that in the morning. That's already re- coming up around six in the morning, an hour before sunrise. And basically, if you had a telescope, you could even see Uranus and Neptune in that same line up above Jupiter. So we can basically so- see all eight of our planets. We're on the eighth, you know, we're on the Earth ourselves, and we can see all seven of the planets uh, and all but one actually in the evening sky. So that's kind of interesting. That's pretty rare. Roughly every 20 years, something like that could happen. I've seen it a couple of times. So that's pretty neat. And then there's a good meteor shower coming up um, called the Quadrantrids on January 3rd into January 4th. It has a really narrow peak, like only a few hours, and it'll be better in the Far East than in China. So it's going to be best here after midnight. There'll be no moon, so that won't be a problem. You can probably still see like 50 of them. You won't see it could be well over 150 in some places. I did see the Geminids. Um, I went out after midnight, stayed out till after 2 in the morning. I saw 21 Geminids for the shower back in December. And friends of mine saw that many even though they didn't wait that late because the moon was still up. So if I would have waited till the moon set around 3, I probably could have seen 100 of them. So the, so the Geminids are pretty good. So the Quadrantids could be really, could be pretty good also. And um, so, and hopefully, of course, the James Webb Telescope will have gone up by now, but we're not sure of that yet. So, um, so I think that's basically it for uh, this week. Awesome. Thanks, Bernie. Sure. And if you couldn't take notes fast enough, you can also check out the monthly What's Up column in the Portland Press Herald. So, Happy New Year, listeners. <laughs> it is um, December 31st today. And we are going to be saying goodbye to 2021 and welcoming 2022 tomorrow. And so for today's show, we wanted to spend some time going over what we think the top 10 stories in science were for this past year. And actually, the first one, we're going to go in reverse. So we're going to have our top 10. This is a Specially curated list by yours truly, uh, myself and Bernie. And again, we're going to start from number 10 and work our way down to our top story of the year. So hopefully, if you've got your list, you can kind of match and kind of compare. We we tried to not be too cliche with with all the other lists um, out that are out there. So this is a personal personalized list from Scientifically Speaking. And actually, the first one, um, we, Bernie, you just mentioned it. It yes, is going James to be Webb. the James Webb Telescope mm-hmm. launch. What should listeners be excited about for the James Webb Telescope? It hasn't done anything yet, but it has been a feat of engineering 
to yeah. get to where it is right now to get to to being being able to be launched yeah so if it was launched a week ago on christmas eve like it was supposed to be uh within the first week we'll already know a lot it won't be completely unfolded yet but as we talked about last time with stephen goodfellow all the things it has to go through for about two weeks so we'll be halfway into that so the chances are pretty good that it'll continue unfolding properly and of course just getting to where it's going is just following physics so that part's easy but all the things we had to put into it but then it's going to discover all these neat things you know like what maybe what black holes are visually see planets and other solar systems uh maybe discover what dark matter or dark energy is and and just seeing the infrared so seeing further back into the universe and how stars are first formed and all the other in incredible things it has you know in store for us as it gets going by the by uh, summer of 2022, we should get really a lot of good data back. Plus, as you said, just a feat of engineering, all the things we learned in the process of building this for, they've been working on this for almost 20 years already, people's entire careers. I think there were almost 10,000 people involved in this. So hopefully, of course, it'll work and it's up there and unfolding properly. But even if it didn't, all the things that we learned in the process that we can apply to other things and future space telescopes too, of course, not just mm -hmm. the James Webb. So there's a lot to look forward to there. Yeah. yeah. Um, number nine. So mm -hmm. this one, I was, I obviously, whenever there is um, kind of underrepresentation involved in science and it's being highlighted, I, I really love to highlight this. I know last year we talked about Katherine Johnson. Um, this year we're talking about Wally Funk and her chance to go up on Blue Origins, which is mm -hmm. Jeff Bezos' um, uh, air or spacecraft, yeah. um, the first human launch of that. And she was one of the original Mercury 13 female pilots in the 1960s, but did not get to go up into space until this year at the age of 82. Mm -hmm. um, was she the oldest person? Well, she was at that point until William Shatner just broke her record. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, and he's 91. <laughs> yeah. But Wally Funk is much more interesting because she she <laughs> she has much more clout to be up there, I think. Yeah. Well, William Shatner played one on the screen. Yeah, <laughs> yeah like that commercial, I, I play a doctor, but I'm not, you know, not. Really. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, and, you know, her word to describe the trip was it was incredible. And um, this happened on July 20th aboard you, Shepard. Oh. Okay. okay what's yeah. Next? So that was number nine. Um, yep. Number eight, Alzheimer's. We have been, there's just been years of research trying to figure out how to um, kind of interfere with the Alzheimer's disease via, you know, drugs or, um, or other means. And um, in this year, there has been a drug that, uh, which is an IV delivered antibody developed by Biogen and marketed as Aduhelm was not approved, but it came out in June, I believe, and it was cleared by the FDA, but actually there was bad news with this one. It was not the drug that many researchers were hoping for. And so um, it apparently clears sticky plagues, plaques of the protein beta amyloid, um, which was thought to cause be one of the primary causes of damage in the brains of people with Alzheimer's disease. But um, only one of the two large clinical trials showed that the drug was better at slowing cognitive decline than a placebo. And so um, in 2020, the FDA actually recommended overwhelmingly against approving the drug. But then um, seven months later, the agency stunned scientists by greenlighting it. And under an accelerated approval process. And so that process actually relies on a surrogate endpoint, which is actually beta amyloid reduction rather than a demonstration of clinical benefit. Um, so there's definitely still a lot of, you know, kind of eh, unsuredness about this drug, but it is a drug that, you know, has made a little bit of advancement as far as um you know, trying to find a way to deal with Alzheimer's disease for for a significant portion of our population. Um, I know that some physicians will not prescribe the drug. And for example, medical centers such as Cleveland Clinic and Mount Sinai have announced that they won't administer it. It is a step in the right direction, 
even though it's not what everybody was hoping for. Rocky start to this drug, but um, potentially could pave the way for, for future um, interventions. Number eight, another terrible disease that we're, well, disorder that we're, we're dealing with here in America, PTSD. Mm -hmm. I was surprised at how uh, prevalent this is. 20% of all the veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan wars actually do suffer from this at some point. And even 30% of first responders, so you don't have to be a veteran to have some of the issues, you know, seeing those type of things every day as you work. So we have 8 million adults in, in this country that are suffering for this. So we have some new um, treatments which work, which are much more effective than previous ones. So it's um, in a controlled fashion, it's taking a certain drug called MDMA. So that is just short for 3,4-methyl antidioxymethamphetamine. So um, this, so if it's done in a proper way, along with talk therapy and other therapy methods, and I watched an interview of, of a veteran who had taken this and it worked really well for him, huh. um, this can work. So basically what it would do, um, the amygdala comes kind of hyperactive because you're always on a state of constant alert if you're at war and stuff like that. So you need to calm all this down and reconnect different parts of your brain in a more um, effective way to increase what's called the neuroplasticity. And that's what this drug will do in combination with other methods and it's been proven really effective. So it's just great to have that. And I also heard that psilocybin and some other active ingredients and mushrooms are used in that and other uh, depression and other methods too that are now being you know, legalized and done properly. They're not, they're not cheap to do, we have to do them right. And so these are great to have some new methods because it's a big problem now with the COVID and all the other things, not just PTSD, but, but getting all the new methods to have this yeah. more effective with the people, not just for the veterans, but pretty much mm -hmm. for everyone. So that's great to have that those new methods that work so well. Awesome. Yep. Mm -hmm. Number six. So this is actually having to do with quantum entanglement, which is a basic principle of quantum mechanics, which is very interesting. We could do whole many shows on this, of course. But what they've done for the first time, not only size-wise, they entangle some living creatures. And these are called tardigrades, which are really tough little creatures. They're just about microscopic. They might be a tenth of a millimeter. But of course, you have to super cool them so they turned them into a, a superconducting qubit, which basically at almost zero degrees Kelvin, things will become superconductive. So that's that's a whole big thing and working on that. So they took the tardigrade, they supercooled it to 10 millikelvin, so a 10 thousandths of a degree above the absolute zero. Then they put it in a transmon qubit. Transmon just means a type of a qubit that reduces the sensitive, sensitivity to charge and noise, which is the problem when you do, you know, handle any um, atoms or particles at those really cold temperatures. So they entangled it with with a um, another qubit. And then, I mean, by itself, yeah, if it would have killed the thing, you know, it wouldn't really have meant much. But then they warmed it up and brought the tardigrade back to life after it was entangled with another qubit. I don't know if the other qubit had a tardigrade in it too or not. So basically they entangled two tardigrades or the, the atom, the quantum states of the atoms in these two creatures. So the neat thing is wow. that they could bring it back to life. And this wasn't just for like, I mean, the process may have only lasted a few minutes, but that tardigrade could be kept at that temperature for like two whole weeks. So we knew that we could free them, but millikelvin, I mean, that's way beyond even the background radiation of the whole universe. That's three degrees Kelvin. This is one ten thousandth of a degree Kelvin. So it's way colder. So these things are way tougher than we thought. And just the size of them to entangle something bigger than just a couple of molecules, a whole living creature, biologically, you know, living creature and bringing it back to life after we entangled it, as we can step that up, you know, maybe we can do that with humans or maybe at least small animals or even plants, because um, uh, quantum entanglement is necessary in photosynthesis, which is a big process. It's necessary in some other things called magnetic navigation used in living processes. So this, this could have huge implications if they can step it up and make it the bigger things than just tardigrade, which we already knew those things were pretty tough. Sure. But if they can step that up, this is a huge breakthrough. That's crazy. Yeah. Wow, these tardigrades. Are <laughs> yeah, so that's not just cryogenetics. I mean, this is getting into you know, entanglement and qubits and bringing things back to life. I mean, you know, there's people right now willing to freeze themselves. They're paying big bucks for this. And then if they figured out something, they can be brought back to life in a thousand years. I mean, that's pretty yeah. neat. Yeah. So we can do that with tardigrades right now. We can't do that with people yet. But this wow. could be a huge step towards that. So I thought it was a really interesting science story for this year. Man, tardigrades can apparently handle a lot. Oh, yeah, they're tough. The radiation, the freezing, at, yeah, for two weeks, you know, at almost zero degrees Kelvin. I mean, you know, we wouldn't last a split second. I know. <laughs> we, we can barely walk around on Mars at 200 below with a spacesuit. 
and these things with no spacesuits i mean they, they look like they wear a spacesuit already but they can last no they look like adorable little gummy bears <laughs> yeah they're called moss piglets because i guess you find yeah. them in moss yeah yeah yeah. But they look like they're in one of these suits that, you know, if you're a sumo wrestler, you put this funny suit on like <laughs> Jimmy Fallon will do on TV. That's, they kind of look like that to Fascinating. me. Fascinating. <laughs> but... All right, number five. No yes. bones, no problem. So what is this about DNA and ancient, ancient DNA in soil? Yes, so this could be really useful. Um, they found some new techniques, and I don't know the details of the techniques, and probably even if I knew them, it would be that interesting to follow <laughs> this through. But we can now extract DNA from frozen soil samples, like up in the Yukon, where, of course, they had a lot of woolly mammoth and saber-toothed tigers and giant sloth and all these neat things. So we can extract the DNA right from the soil samples um, and like 10 to 20,000 uh, years ago, and then we can see what was actually in those other than finding, you know, the actual thing like a bone of, the, of a woolly mammoth. We can get it right from the soil and then figure out what, what else was in there. Mm. That could really en enhance the whole archaeology and the, all the different things that we can learn about that. Interesting. All right. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. that's cave, ancient cave, ancient DNA in soil found in caves. Mm -hmm. Well, we can learn from that. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Numero cuatro. Yeah, we're the distant four. quasars. Yeah. Okay, so quasars are really interesting anyway, because they are basically proto galaxies. They're basically just the black hole of the nucleus of the galaxy, mm -hmm. uh, feeding all kinds of things into it. Basically, it eventually will form into a galaxy. They're really powerful. So they found the most distant one ever. Mm -hmm. um, it's thirteen point. Well, it's probably more than 13 billion light years away, but it formed when the universe was only 670 million years old. Mm -hmm. So it's about 13.8 billion. So it's the most distant. Of course, we can see it at that distance because of the huge amount of power. It has more power than entire galaxies. And it shoots these disks of um, uh, magnet, you know, radiation that's kind of focused and going almost the speed of light, 99.9% .9 of the speed of light, because of the way it spins and forms the accretion disk and so on. So they're really powerful. Uh, Quasar stands for quasi-stellar radio source, discovered by Jocelyn Bell back in 1967, I think, somewhere on there. And if they're pointing right at us, they're actually called blazars, because then they're <laughs> even more powerful, like a more powerful thing than the quasar, which is already like the most powerful thing in, right. in the universe. You know, the black hole, of course, is feeding all this and driving it. So just finding them at more distance and finding out more about them and how they really work and generate all these fields and the, the most energetic thing in the universe, like I said, I mean, the, the, the black hole, we talked over about the ultramassive black holes. They have black holes at the center that could be up to 100 billion solar masses. Mm. So this is the pure beginning of a galaxy. Yeah. And of course, most of them have cooled down. There's very few galaxies now that put out that much energy. Those are all just called active galactic nuclei, which is a very interesting thing to study in physics anyway. But to finding them more and more further away and finding out some other things in the process is a pretty neat discovery. Yeah. Um, and on the same line, the Event Horizon Telescope in this year, I believe in March, also produced the first um, polarized light photograph of Messier 87. Um, so one of the, the massive, basically looking at the black hole at the center of the M87 galaxy yeah. and what that looks like in polarized light. And there is a, it's basically just a, a photo that's been overlaid over the original photograph, which was the first photograph of a black hole taken in 2019. Um, but essentially, having being able to image um, uh, with polarized light will allow us further to understand how the magnetic fields allow the black hole to essentially eat matter and launch really powerful jets. So also along the same lines, very exciting. Yep. Good. Number... So you get the next two. Yeah, number yep. three. Yep. Um, so, number three. Mm -hmm. The U.S. is now no longer the only country from Earth who has a rover on Mars, or many rovers now. <laughs> um, China did land their first um, Mars rover. The Zhurong landing was basically one of the biggest tests of China's deep space exploration um, and their kind of engineering capabilities. And um, that launched earlier this year and ta has taken some very impressive photos. Um, but essentially on, um, I believe, May 15th, 
was when the um, the vehicles separated from the orbiter at about 4 a.m. Mm-hmm. and um, launched into the atmosphere at an altitude of 125 kilometers and hurled towards the surface at 4.8 kilometers a second. Um, of course, it had a, a blade of heat shield and... Um, yeah, good thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't just drop it. <laughs> exactly. Um, but this is a huge thing for China. It's It means that we potentially have um, space to collaborate with other countries in um, exploring Mars. So it's not just the U.S. And um, it is their first mission to Mars. And um, actually, they're not the second. They're the third. Russia has landed a spacecraft on the planet, right? Um, but anyways, it's it's a it's a huge thing because China basically was able to do it um, in a shorter amount of time than, of course, NASA did. Um, but obviously, NASA was um, they took decades to to work on this, and and um, you know this is just a great show of the building on top of what others have done to kind of you know get there faster. So um, we're excited to kind of continue to see what comes out of that. And don't forget their space station too. Uh, oh yeah, and they have a they have a new space station that's mm-hmm. now orbiting. Well, they put it together this year, um, and they're they're building it. It won't take nearly as long as the ISS that we're building, and it's going to be just mm-hmm. for the Chinese. Ask. The only thing I I mean I do remember one thing: one of the rockets to launch the first part of the space station, they didn't control it when it came back down, so it could have hit any place within a yep. certain latitude range. It ended up being okay, just landing in the Indian Ocean. Lucky. But that was a little dangerous. So I, I yeah. think they corrected that for the second part of the space station that they launched. Right. But there's astronauts in it right now. And at one point, like I mentioned, we had like 14 people over in the Earth because we had the new Chinese space this Our own ISS was seven people. And then the four that were just up there for three days. Yep. But the Chinese are doing all these things now. And they have yeah. the biggest radio telescope in the world and a lot of other astronomy and science-related things, too. Well, I hope that all of it is is still for the sake of science and learning and exploring hmm. and not just to one up. Well, I'm sure it's for some other, even the one that we built in Arecibo, that was first really funded because of military and government yeah. type things. We ended up using for a lot of scientific, you know, yeah. also served as the radar. We got great details of asteroids and things that might hit the earth because of it. And of course, as you know, that collapsed last year. Well, we're going to build a new one, but it won't be that quick. All right. Yes. So number two, there's there have been two um, vaccines that have not probably gotten as much attention as the COVID vaccine, but I really wanted to highlight these because these mean a lot for us as a human population here on Earth. And, you know, we we love talking about astronomy here on Scientifically Speaking, but it's also really important that we acknowledge the practical work that is happening here on our home blue planet. And so, um, as you all know, we have two mRNA COVID-19 vaccines, one from Moderna, one from Pfizer. Um, But HIV, a vaccine for HIV using mRNA technology, has been um, developed and tested with mice. And so, um, how these work is... They, the, the vaccine essentially delivers instructions to make two of the key HIV proteins um, that the, those are essentially some of the cells in an inoculated animal assembly. And these two proteins basically produce virus-like particles um, studded with kind of copies of, of the proteins on their surface. And they don't cause infection or disease because they lack kind of the complete genetic code of HIV. What they do do is that they match whole infectious HIV in terms of stimulating suitable immune responses. So very similar to how COVID-19 vaccine works. And um, they look very promising. They've done studies in mice and um, they've done studies in masticates. So some of the um, uh, species of monkeys and um they, they did find some antibodies in in uh, in both of those so there's there's definitely some promises the doses of the uh, vaccine were quite high but they were well tolerated and produced mild temporary adverse effects um, such as like loss of appetite but um, it seems like by you know uh, week 58 so a year or so um, the vaccinated mass case for example had developed measurable levels of 
of neutralizing antibodies um, against some of the most uh, most of the strains of the 12 HIV strains. Mm-hmm. And then um, second vaccine in this category, also very big, is there is a new malaria vaccine which has been proved which has proved to be 77% effective in some early trials and could be a major breakthrough against the disease. Um, So kind of like PTSD, like Alzheimer's, malaria kills more than 400,000 people a year. Um, Well, not like, but also just very prevalent Um, and mostly children in sub-Saharan Africa. And, you know, over the years, there have been many, many different vaccines trialed, but this one is the first one that has met the WHO target, which I believe was 75% efficacy. And, um, and I believe they, they do now recommend this vaccine. Um, so I believe the name is Mosky Rix, <laughs> like Mosquito Rix. And, uh, and um, it has been Im- administered so far to 800,000 children in Ghana, Kenya, and Malawi. And um, it seems to be able to prevent 39% of malaria cases and 29% of severe malaria cases. So better than zero. Yeah. All right, uh, Bertie, take us home with number one. Okay, the number one story, um, even more useful potentially than all these other things we talked about, which are great, obviously, to save as many people. But this is a little space mission called DART. It was just launched a few months ago, and it'll actually get to where it's going uh, this year in 2022. So that's a clever acronym. It stands for Double Asteroid Redirection Test. <laughs> So basically, we're like throwing a dart at an asteroid, but there's a lot to it because we can measure exactly how much that will deflect the asteroid. And in the future, we can use this to actually deflect an asteroid that's heading for the Earth. And then we could save all 8 billion people instead of the several million people that we're saving now <laughs> with some of the vaccines and Alzheimer's and PTSD treatments and all the other things we talked about. So this is a near-Earth asteroid, not one that's going to hit us anytime soon, just a good one to kind of practice on. But it's an interesting astro- asteroid because it has a moon. We have already known that asteroids even have moons, so that's whether you get the double asteroid. So the asteroid is called Didymos, and its moon is called Dimorphos. So we're going to be hitting Dimorphos with this little thing and then measuring the exact effect. I mean, it's just basic, you know, kinetic energy and Newton's laws, but we have to see exactly how this is going to work because when we do this on, in real life, we have to, you know, de- deflect it in the right direction because otherwise it may not have hit us if we don't do all the math right and we'll force it to hit us. Or if we don't deflect it properly, we can make it worse. Or we don't deflect it enough and it could still hit us. So it's a redirection test. And as I said, in, in about 10 months from now, we'll know how that worked and all the details on it. And of course, do f- develop better ones in the future to actually hit asteroids that, you know, could potentially yeah. be hitting us and so on. So it's a, it's a great example of finally, we've hit other asteroids before, to, to figure out craters and materials, what they're made out of, they're basically loose rubble piles. They're not very dense. Mm-hmm. But now to do the kinetic energy to the deflection part, we're stepping up slowly in what we can do to help save the entire Earth, basically. Yeah. yeah. It's so funny to think about the, that, you know, this kind of solution is actually a solution and not something a little bit more, huh. you know, not, not like just a slingshot. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I guess it doesn't take much there. I mean, hitting it with this tiny thing, I mean, just do the mass differences. Yeah. It's so tiny, it's literally not even throwing a fly or a dart at this thing. Yeah. But it'll be enough. It'll do the trick. There's other things. I mean, you don't want to blow it up with a nuclear bomb. Sure. But there's something called a gravity tractor. You could just place something next to it, and just the gravitational interacting with two, two objects, not even hitting it, could be enough. Mm. But in this case, they're actually going to hit it. But it'll be a very minor effect, but it could be enough. Yeah. yeah. You just need to push it. A little bit yeah. away. <laughs> as long as they know which way, because that's right. the whole direction <laughs> test. That's the other part of the acronym. But I'm sure we can rely on the math and the computers, and you know, people are smart enough to, to figure that out. Certainly, yep. everything is moving at like you know, like seventy thousand miles an hour up there. So that's pretty interesting too. It's not easy yep. to do, but they can do it. Yep. yep. Awesome. Well, yep. there you have it, listeners. Those were <laughs> our top ten stories in science for 2021. And we are so excited. Well, I don't know. 2022 sounds like 2022, which means it might be a repeat of 2020. Well, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> but no, we're just kidding. Happy New Year's, everyone. Hopefully you have learned something new. 
and um, lots of great things that have come out of science this year and um, we will see you guys in 2022. You've been listening to Scientifically Speaking here on WMPG with myself and Bernie. Stay tuned for something for the weekend with Anella. And for your favorite news, just a reminder to vaccinate, mitigate, and then we can all congregate.